Welcome to Between Two Barrels, a twice-weekly podcast recorded at Studio 66, presented by Tennessee Legend Distillery. Between Two Barrels is a show that highlights legends of all shapes and sizes from across the state of Tennessee. From the queen of country Dolly Parton to the elusive Tennessee wild man. From our head distiller to our legendary staff and products. On this show, you will learn some terms of the alcohol industry, as well as learn some awesome recipes for food and cocktails alike. Join us as we journey through the volunteer state to bring you stories of legends that involve the beautiful state of Tennessee, from country music as well as rock and roll royalty, cryptids, distillery origins, carbonated beverage beginnings, and everything in between. This show truly highlights what makes a legend a Tennessee legend. What's up, legends, and welcome back to another episode of the Between Two Barrels podcast. I'm your host, Opie, and joined by the manager, b What's up, B? Not a whole lot, man. Continuing to get fully into the Christmas spirit, uh, as I think I mentioned on the last episode, we are going to be having the family Christmas at our place this year. Mm. We wound up going out both Saturday and Sunday to get some things for decorating purposes. Of course, a month ago, my wife went, I think... I think I know for sure three Sundays in a row, or maybe four sun or Saturdays in a row, to the Carm Christmas store over mm. in Knoxville to be able to get some things. And of course, this was before or around Halloween. Like mm-hmm. they had already gotten the store opened up for people to come in and get some stuff. So we're of course decorated here at the store uh, located 870 Winfield Dunn Parkway, Sevierville, Tennessee three seven eight seven six. If you have not been here or if you plan on making the trip at any point in time, get that put into the GPS to deliver you to the home of some of the best spirits in the Smoky Mountains. And we will be happy to let you try several of those products, including some licensed products brought to you by our friends over at Anthem Spirits, including an entire line of Assassin's Creed branded spirits, a vodka, a flavored rum or a spiced rum rather, and a four-year aged bourbon. We also just released in partnership with them the Crow Black Coffee Vodka. So if you do have some people on your Christmas list that you are trying to find some really fun and branded spirits, look no further than the partnership between Anthem Spirits and Tennessee Legend Distillery bringing you some of those fantastic products. And if that's not your bag, we definitely have all of our regular flavored as well as non-flavored spirits here at Tennessee Legend Distillery. Rex has got his hat on, his Santa hat and beard. The tinsel and garland is going up everywhere, not only, like I said, at the store, but at the house as well. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, we are definitely in the Christmas spirit, as it were. What about you guys? Well, you know, tis the season to be merry. We are uh, we're in the Christmas spirit. We have watched some Christmas movies. So we always kick off the season on Thanksgiving night with Christmas Vacation. Maddie oh, and I. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the it's the new tradition. Uh, we used to do it every Thanksgiving night with her grandfather when I would go over there to eat and her father. So this Thanksgiving, we left Thanksgiving dinner, came back to our house, and kicked off the season right. Uh, we got our tree decently early, but just found time yesterday to finally decorate it not too far behind still early enough to say we'll have one for at least almost a month before we take it down because we'll probably wait till after new year's like most people do but i found a loophole like all october she's very nice and kind about playing into my horror fanatic yeah you're you're more of a halloween more of a halloween guy she's so nice and so kind about uh taking that journey with me into new horror movies traditional horror movies because she's not really a horror person and so and that's kind of a give give in christmas i watch a lot of the christmas stuff that she loves well i found a loophole last night and introduced her to krampus (laughs) she said of course you found a loophole i was like it's christmas movie she said but it's scary and i said yeah 
but it's a Christmas movie. Uh, <laughs> like right. it counts. <laughs> that's like that's like Gremlins. Yeah, it, yeah, Gremlins is a Christmas movie. So I found a loophole. We watched Krampus last night. I had uh, honestly not sat through the whole movie. I didn't see it in theaters. I had not sat through it my entire life. I'd seen bits and pieces. It's a wild ride, man. It is uh, not. I I've seen as much as what the, it's, the previews uh, are. It's That's a, it. a horror comedy. Okay. It's, it's got some very cheesy, silly moments, but an end that you're just like, I. Uh, the whole aspect of it, because there's some some stars in it. Right. It's a star-studded cast. Okay. And it's just an ensemble. A very star-studded ensemble, uh, um, and it's just. Uh, it's a wild ride. Uh, I recommend seeing it for a good laugh, a good, you know, brainless Christmas horror movie, uh, as as Christmas horror movies go, because there are a, a, quite a few of them, like Black Christmas and things like that. So I did find a loophole, but we did get it decorated. Um, since we have our own house now, we got my Christmas collection from what was decoration at the house uh, in Morristown, uh, all the Santas. We had tons right. of Santas. My brother's got snowmen, and my sister's collection is all reindeer. So now that uh, we have our own... trees. We've got trees. trees everywhere. So now that me and Nolan have our own houses, instead of them all being at Morningside, all the totes went to our individual houses right. and now part of our decoration. So, And we always knew that that was Mom's intention. Right. In building, over time, these massive Christmas decoration collections that at least three of the genres would be going with the siblings. Right. So that's fun, kind of going back through. I'm like, oh, I remember when she got this one and the story behind this one and when we were putting them up. So we still got a few totes to go through before we're fully decorated. Um, but it is the Christmas season. We are partaking in a little challenge this December called Whamageddon. This Christmas? Going as long as you can without hearing it. You don't lose gotcha. until you hear Wham's version. Gotcha. Covers your safe. Anybody else can sing it except yes. one. So, like here at the here at the the distillery, I can't remember if Wham's the. There's another. We have the Glee version. I know on our Christmas playlist. Yes, with Finn and Rachel. I have yet to hear the Wham version, so I'm safe. We don't really really, really listen to radio. We're more podcast or personal playlist pe- right. people, um, and uh, haven't heard it in passing in stores yet. So. We are at December 4th, and so far we're doing good. So what's the prize for this? I don't know. We haven't determined, like, if we both get through Whamageddon all December, then I guess, you know, we treat ourselves. But, like, if I I lose, I should have to... I was going to say it should end December 25th. It should. Midnight. It should end at December 25th, midnight. So, uh, you know, if if, if we decide on a... If there's a clear victor, what the loser has to do, then... Then I'll uh, update the listeners and you, and uh, it's actually pretty, pretty smart. Um, I know most people used to play it w- with. Um, it was like Mariah Geddon or something like that, or um, but that's pretty impossible to look. That one for sure. That one and these days. Speaking of playlists and the store playlist, we don't even have that one on the store. That playlist. was an we owner's decision. We absolutely, yeah, refused to put yes. that one on there. Yes, our, <coughs> one of the few things that our owner really like meddled in was just like she will not be on our Christmas playlist this song is overplayed overdone and annoying so that will not be on our store playlist one that's kind of starting to get there is uh, um, you're all that I need mm-hmm. uh, uh, Clarkson Kelly Clarkson yes and underneath the tree yeah, yeah. and it's and it's just because of the 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 yell or the scream singing mm-hmm. which is in Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas. Mhm. And and that's I think more of it than anything else is just because I mean, yeah, you can get upbeat and get have some fun with Christmas, but I don't want to sit there at Christmas and be ah, la, 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 I feel la. like you're yelling at me. Yeah. Yeah, you're not singing. There's a difference between singing and yelling. There's a difference between projecting and yelling. That's what we tell our theater kids. It's like there's it's a like, difference between projecting and yelling your lines. It's it's like it's like going up to one of the distilleries in Gatlinburg. Yes. There is a difference between projecting and yelling 
at your customers. <laughs> so before we get too much further into it, because I've got my thoughts on Christmas trees and and how early people have been getting them. Um, mm. But uh, some ha- more housekeeping stuff here for the distillery. Um, we are continuing online to mm-hmm. run our uh, 40% off of anything over $50. Uh, online at the Tennessee Legend Merch dot com. So if you do still have anyone else that you are looking to try to buy some candles or any of our other non alcoholic merch for, um, you can go on there. We're still running that same discount. The new code will be up as soon as possible. Uh, but we are going to be doing that forty percent off of fifty dollars or more. And the deadline for making sure that you are guaranteed getting your stuff delivered to you before Christmas is december the 11th you have a week from today to make sure that you get those orders in so if you're going to be getting anything for someone for christmas make sure you get those orders Mm -hmm. in by next monday by december the 11th um what's crazy is if you were to spend over 50 dollars with the discount that's like over 20 dollars off your order yeah great deals it great is a very great deal. Very great deal. Um, you're all but cutting whatever. You're you're paying half price for almost everything at mm-hmm. this point. Mm-hmm. So um, beyond that, in store, of course, Peppermint Mocha has fully arrived. Um, it is that time of year. We will be carrying the Peppermint Mocha all the way through February. Uh, and then March, we'll be releasing the blueberries and cream mm. back again. So if you are waiting on that one, it will be available in early March. Beyond that, just a couple other things in terms of some housekeeping notes for the distillery. Um, all locations are going into more of their winter hours, so make sure you check online for the different hours on the locations across Tennessee. Uh, of course, the Marathon Motor Works building uh, does have unique hours to begin with, and our hours for that operation are already kind of unique, as it were. Um, But because of it being the holiday season, make sure that you go ahead and check those as well. We may actually be dark on some dates for that location coming up after the first of the year. And, of course, the best place to be able to find out and keep up to date with all that information is through the Tennessee Legend Distillery social media sites, which, of course, you can access directly or you will be able to find them on any of the Studio 66 sites that could link you to any of that information as well. And speaking, speaking of dark, go ahead. Uh, I feel bad for Nashville at this time of year because it's like four o'clock. Oh yeah, when it starts getting dark, the the nightlife in Nashville, as it were, is a, a little bit more bustling because there's more night to to yeah, there's work. More with. night to work with. I mean, yeah, like most kids are getting out of school, and it's like, well, it's almost bedtime. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you I get out of it. school, you get out of school, and then an hour and a half I later, and it. it's it's. It's dark outside. Yeah. I mean, I look outside now at 530, and it's it's already dark, and it's like, man. But this is also the time of year that I like to go ahead and build a fire outside and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other locations, Cookville will likely be going back to an 8 p.m. closing time, except for um, specific nights, uh, any game nights, any uh, social activity nights that they're going to be having, uh, swing dance. Uh, paint and sip classes, karaoke, anything like that that they'll be having out there, they will likely be staying open staying open a little bit later in the evening. Um, and then, of course, for any of those specialty events, make sure to keep up with that information through the website. And here in Sevier County, our Newport Highway location is going to keep it same hours. They've been operating off the 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. schedule for quite mm-hmm. some time, seven days a week, and they are going to continue to operate on that schedule throughout uh, here at the Winfield Dunn location, the one on 66, we are starting um, what would be yesterday, Monday. Yes. Um, we are actually going to be uh, closing at 9 p.m. at this point. Um, and then after we get past the first of the year, we're going to be calling it back to 8 p.m. on several nights. So, again, the best way to keep up with any and all information concerning the distillery uh, as well as Studio 66, of course. Just follow us on the different social media platforms. And we are on most all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, as far as Christmas trees, okay. whenever it comes to 
some of the uh, cut your own or Christmas tree farms. Yes. Waiting until December is is apparently taboo because I looked up because it was our plans to try to go to one of the places this past weekend to cut down our own Christmas tree. And before we went out, I started looking and a majority of the places open up either Thanksgiving weekend or just before Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. And a majority of their stock for your cut to own or cut your own is already cut and gone by the first week of December. Whoa. Yeah. That's a little early. So it, it, it was like astounding to me that one, someone is going to be putting in a considerable amount of effort to maintain the life of that tree or, or delaying the inevitable death of said tree, I should say. Yes. For over a month. And I get it. I mean, Thanksgiving itself listed as a holiday, whereas Christmas is a season. I understand this. Sure. The concept. Um, but, or just the holiday season in general. And as part of the holiday season, you have the specific day of Thanksgiving. Um, but all encompassed, you can have all of this stuff done. Like, the, the basically the people who are like, all right, October 31st is come and gone. November the 1st is here. It's Christmas. Break out, yeah, break yeah. out all the Christmas stuff. These are the people who start doing that type of decorating as of November 1st. So that way, by the time it does get to Thanksgiving, as part of their festivities, they are going out and selecting. They're go- they're going on a quest to select that most important of Christmas symbols. Good old family Christmas tree. And, and they are getting this as, like I said, part of their, I guess, like the the... Wives and daughters go shopping. The husbands and sons go out to find the Christmas tree, or, or, as part the dads, of it, they the dads you know haggling with the lot and oh, right. Well, if you, I'll, I'll throw in a rope and tie it on for you. You got right. it. Right. Do you get a deal. That's going to be the contest for this particular episode. How many what movie movies, quote yeah, references do you wind up picking them up from? <laughs> and all of them, of course, have to be Christmas, uh, yeah. Christmas themed. Um. But no, I mean, it was just really, really strange to me in the fact that all of these places that had that opportunity, yeah. it was already done. I mean, there was one here locally um, that had some inventory available. Uh, but as you know, uh, actually, I needed to ask, do you guys, did you guys do live or, or artificial? Oh, we, we do live. Okay. All right. S- same. Yeah. Uh, do you have a preference? Do you guys go the the spruce, uh, uh, scotch pine? Do you do more? Um, I think we wound up with a spruce this year because it looked the healthiest. Like we like this year, it, everything was so like with everything going on with the family and like all that. Like it was just let's go to Food City and get a tree. So you have the really dense. Um, the yes. center of it is green, but yes. the the ends of it have almost a bluish hue yeah to but, it. And, and mainly because what i did was i ran my hand down them and like if needles went falling i went Mm-mm. no this is that won't last a week we're not taking this <laughs> yeah. right so we went with spruce route this year i got you um which is a fantastic tree they mm-hmm. don't have any of the the pointies um katie's katie likes to do more teapot trees she likes short stout trees. Okay. The the shorter and wider trees, the better. Um, and more so with the spruce, you're going to have the the uh, um, more full on conic shapes, yes. typically. Um, which I mean, we were able to achieve with the tree that we got. Uh, we went with the Scotch pine. Mm. Um, so we have more pointed needles, whereas your needles are, are rounded on the mm-hmm. end. Um, and we originally went down to um, support the uh, Boy Scouts. The Scouts, yeah. Or the Scouts to be able to get our tree. 
Um, but unfortunately, were I unable to find one that fit her aesthetic, the one that she, she really liked. Um, but we did not walk away without supporting the scouts. Um, they had some other, uh, decor and actually a, a, um, keep your tree green solution, uh, to be able to put in with the water for the tree. So we still made sure and, and, uh, sponsored the scouts in some form or another. Um, but wound up, of course, going over to Lowe's and finding ours. Um, along with some other stuff, we got some more lights and things like that. And, of course, spent the, the weekend. Uh, Saturday was not able to do so. Um, so we got some stuff on Saturday, all the rain and everything else going on. Uh, I spent most of the day yesterday uh, getting all the decorations and stuff put up outside. <laughs> and, of course, once I made my way inside... Um, got recruited to to help do all that other stuff but yeah um she fully does all the tree decorating like i don't she she has a certain aesthetic a certain look that she likes to go for so i let her do it um i just help when whenever and wherever i am needed otherwise i'm usually sitting down either watching football or or playing a video game or something like that at that point in time Mm mm-hmm um but yeah uh the dynamic of the tree this year was definitely fun um of course learning (laughs) that there are a lot of lot of people that that go really early in the season uh even before thanksgiving to be able to get their trees um we see all the christmas tree lots in the next thing you know and here in a couple of weeks you're going to wind up seeing the uh fireworks places popping up all over uh, for new year's (laughs) Um, yep. It's it's literally like living yeah. in this town, uh, you in guys, this area, it's season to season. You guys, it is. It really is. And the seasons happen way earlier than what they're supposed yeah. to. Uh, but you guys are in uh, what would be a new place, your first yeah. Christmas in a new first place. First Christmas in a new place. Uh, we are spending our first Christmas uh, in this new place. Mm-hmm. And we actually got an ornament. Um I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's got 2023, uh, new beginnings, new whatever, new home, yeah, something like that. You, guys have, you got one? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm glad I'm not the, yeah. the, the only one that has one of those. Um, Madison and her family, uh, there's this big thing of like ornaments establishing, you know, dates and things. Like obviously we have an engagement ornament. We have a wedding ornament we have new home ornament um we have like we have a whole ornament dedicated to downtown morristown where i proposed to her so that's a big thing is like well thank you for the idea for some additional gifts you're very welcome you're very welcome but yeah uh, madison's uh them they're a big like date ornament uh and madison herself is like a big memory collector so like movies we've been to she has the stubs in a scrapbook We've got a large wooden yeah. chest, or anytime, Katie has a large wooden chest. Anytime that all I that get her flowers, in. once it dies, she puts the petals in, in a page right. in the scrapbook, or like behind something, or in a shadow box, or stuff like that. So she's really big on keeping memories, uh, not just and and you know because I really respect it because the physicality of having the memory. Like I, I'm big on making the memory. But I'm also finding that, like, it's really good to have something from the memory in case the day comes where you start forgetting those things. Right. You have a tangible mm-hmm. something to help yes. spark. Yes, so, exactly. No, I totally get it. Totally get it. And the Christmas season is always a big time to make memories with your friends and family. So, And, and of course, what better way to bring back those memories or the the times of year the holidays that that i mean to to go back to october and Mm. talk about energies and stuff like that Mm -hmm. that the holidays incite and generate more energy so i mean those types of emotions thoughts and everything else um for the Harry Potter nerds, the Pensieve, you're pulling mm-hmm. that memory energy out mm-hmm. and attaching it to Something. that that particular object. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and what better what better way to to proudly display display those and for them to be able to gain more energy than to adorn 
adorn your Christmas tree with them. Absolutely. And that is actually uh, what this episode is doing. This month we are doing a series of legends of the season and the histories of them, um, how they've modernized and evolved over time. Uh, So when we get back from a commercial break, we are going to first start off with the Christmas tree. When Between Two Barrels podcast returns. Do you go nuts about our products at Tennessee Legend Distillery? Do you think our products should be on nuts? Well, look no further than Southern Vet Sweets. At Southern Vet Sweets, they specialize in baked goods and desserts that are sure to tantalize your taste buds. They make a variety of treats from cookies to alcohol-infused delights and modern takes on Southern favorites. They provide custom and bulk orders at southernvetsweets.com. Make sure to look through their catalog of tasty Southern favorites. And not only do they have sweet treats for your taste buds, they are also veteran-owned and operated. And whenever you place your order, tell Jason, Tennessee Legend Distillery sent you. Legends and B, it is Christmas tree season. It is. Um, before we went to break, uh, of course, we were talking about our different experiences on procuring and decorating and just getting into the spirit for this time of season. Um, but have you ever sat there and actually wondered where? I've often wondered why. Why? <laughs> Never where, <laughs> like, um, because at the I end know of the where day, they come from. But these are <laughs> corpses, trees. Oh, yeah, if you think about it. But yeah, I mean, because you're cutting it down and you're bringing you're it in, it. and then yeah, and it slowly dies. Well, I I like house. to I like to say that that in in my personal, I wind up using the the dead carcass yeah. in in a in a new sense. Um, it is recycled. In one form or another. That's true. Um, I either use it uh, for heat. Mm-hmm. It either winds up getting cut down and uh, burned in a, a, yeah. a campfire. Uh, or I wind up attaching weight to it and sinking it um, to the bottom of a body of water. So that way fish can then turn it into a home. That's smart. That's cool. Yeah. Brush piles. I like that. Yep. And it's, of course, if you throw it out into the woods or, or a big giant bush that eats things, like it's just going back into. Oh yeah, it's going to end up eventually, you know, just deteriorating, deteriorating over time and being absorbed Returning by other back greenery. To, yeah, return to the earth. Oh, oh, as part of the ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, if you wind up going and tossing it out, of course, eventually there is going to be decay. But you're going to have things like uh, insects that will mm-hmm. bore into it. Um, other things that wind up eating the insects, then you'll also have fungus that will wind up growing on it and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I mean, so uh, that help aid and, and, and speed up the decomposition process for it to basically return back to soil. Yeah. I mean, because all soil on the earth is nothing but the decayed remnants of what was what was yes. at some point in time. So, I mean, it's just a returning to and, of course, what ultimately all of us are going to do is just return to the earth yeah. in, in some form or another so from dust you came to dust you will go so yeah um we we literally of course are taking the the tree yes. and and adorning it with all sorts of decoration <laughs> so uh, well i mean i guess in a sense it'd be the symbolism of the year in and of itself coming to an end and you are the 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 meaning of christmas from the protestant or you know religion is the fact of you know uh jesus christ the savior was born who eventually you know died for our sins so that we could be reborn Mm -hmm. Uh, so in essence the the tree in and of itself would be viewed as a a 
uh, uh, ceremonial garb for the year. Uh, you put all your different things on it. These are the things that, you know, thankful for, previous memories. Uh, this is the, the, this is the jewel adorned, uh, uh, sarcophagus <laughs> of what that year would be. It's a, it's a, it's a representation. It's, it's purely yeah. a representation. Um, but what exactly is it that it is, uh, representing? I that- mean, and it could represent different things to different people. Mm-hmm. Um, different people wind up having trees for different seasons. Like I know people yeah, who holiday trees. Uh, do trees. full on holiday trees yeah. that will start in in you know October. Trees with potentially in and different do, rooms with different themes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got two trees currently. We've got the main tree and what would be the living room, mm-hmm. and then in the front room, um, the, the people who we bought the house from. I don't know if it was done intentionally or they may have accidentally forgot that in their little attic crawl mm-hmm. space that they had left a silver platter and a little fiber optic Dollar General $10 Christmas tree. Um, we have brought the Christmas tree down and, and put it up in the uh, other front room. Um, and then, of course, the silver platter now has... My little Debbie Christmas tree cakes, among uh, peppermints and some other little tasty treats on it, sitting on the Christmas table. Um, but yeah, uh, looking into the the origins mm-hmm. of the lore, the lore of the Christmas tree, um, and modern Christmas trees, according to Reddit, which where we get most of our information from, so. If anything comes mm-hmm. off as incorrect, blame the person that wrote it. Uh, <laughs> modern Christmas trees originated in Central Europe and the Baltic states, particularly Estonia, Germany, and Livonia, which is now Latvia, and during the Renaissance in early modern Europe. Its 16th century origins are sometimes associated with Protestant Christian reformer Martin Luther, who is said to have first added it lighted candles to an evergreen tree. The Christmas tree was first recorded to be used by German Lutherans in the 16th century with records indicating that a Christmas tree was placed in the Cathedral of Strasbourg in 1539. Under the leadership of the Protestant reformer Martin Bucer, the Moravian Christians put lit candles on those trees. The earliest known firmly dated representation of a Christmas tree is on the keystone sculpture of a private home in Turkheim, all says part then a part of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which is today known as France, with the date of fifteen seventy six. Now it's candles on the tree. Which would be rather difficult. I mean Not I've a fire seen it now and th- right. That wouldn't be a fire hazard in any capacity. Um the seventies brought us a recreation of these the oil light candle or the oil light you yeah. know what i'm talking about yeah. so and you can actually still buy those mm-hmm. oddly enough um i think they've done some changes made some changes to those that way they're not as hazardous um but you still get the same effect and you can of course see what look to be like little oil lamps um reminiscent of what is being described in this now of course there is thought to be some definite predecessors to what the modern Christmas tree is. Um, and that is to believe to have been related to the tree of paradise of mist- medieval mystery plays that were given on the 24th of December, which is the commemoration and name day of Adam and Eve in various countries. In such plays, a tree decorated with apples representing fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and thus the original sin that Christ took away, and round white wafers, try saying that (laughs) several times fast, uh, to represent the Eucharist and redemption. Now that was used for setting the play, and like the Christmas crib, the paradise tree was later placed in homes, and the apples were replaced by round objects such as shiny red balls. So couple of different potential representations mm-hmm. we've got the lutherans talking about having trees with candles on them and some stuff going as far back as the roman empire 
uh, and what is you know part of modern day France. And then of course we have um, uh, medieval Europe talking about um, a commemoration and plays being done on the twenty fourth of December, mm-hmm. uh, which also is the is it the mark of the winter solstice? Yes, Festivus. Yes, There's, uh, and Saturnalia. Uh, there are actually, uh, not to get too in detail on a tangent about where a lot of holidays come from, uh, pagan lineages to Christmas trees. Oh yeah, and I'm they're sure pretty the much pagan lineage to most holidays that we oh for sure celebrate and kind of took into our own thing and made it our own. But that's a story for a different time. Right. Um, now, by the end of the Middle, Middle Ages, an early predecessor appears referred in the 15th century regiment of the Cistercian, Cistercian Alcobaca Monastery in Portugal. So we've got mm-hmm. 15th century in Portugal. Right. <laughs> Hachu. The regiment of the local high Sar- sacristians. Mm-hmm. Of the Cistercian order refers to what may be considered the oldest references to the Christmas tree. Note on how to put the Christmas tree branch, Skillicut, on the Chris on the Christmas Eve. You'll look for a large branch of green laurel, and you shall reap many red oranges, and place them on the branches that come of the laurel, specifically as you have seen. <laughs> and in every orange, you shall put a candle and hang the branch by a rope in the pole which shall be the candle of the high altar so basically they were making not even real trees at that time Mm -mm. in Portugal they were making what would have been artificial trees using real components but at that point would have been making an artificial tree Um, other sources have offered a connection between the symbolism of the first documented Christmas trees in Germany around 1600 and the trees of pre-Christian traditions through this claim has been disputed. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the use of evergreen trees, wreaths, and garlands to symbolize eternal life was a custom of the ancient Egyptians, Chinese, and Hebrews, Mm -hmm. and tree worship was common among the pagan Europeans and survived their conversion to Christianity and the Scandinavian customs of decorating the house and barn with evergreens at the new year to scare away the devil and of setting up a tree for the birds during Christmas time. So in that, it basically, I mean, it's a, a an adaptation of what I was saying, or what I was saying is an adaptation of this, and the fact that oh yeah, you're the the fact that the tree is a carcass, but yeah. you know, it's serving other purposes. Yeah. And in this, you know, and it also probably really, um, especially in the pre-Christian, what we what most modern Christian would call pagan days um, was was since it was an evergreen kind of surviving winter because yes. we think winter is hard in 2023. Oh gosh. In the uh, 16th sort of and 15th pre- century, anything pre convenience, heat, yeah, yeah, anything pre convenience was impossible to survive winter. So anything that they could, you know, please the gods, you know, allow us to survive this winter um the saturnalia belief the festivus belief the um uh, the mother earth belief of um evergreens and and wreaths and stuff like that and metal sweet and and there's so much lore behind these things and and like i said for every holiday that we especially when the christian faith came um took it and kind of changed it for our our benefit right and our belief which so they 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 even did it with Halloween so (laughs) why would you say something so controversial yet so brave (laughs) um no I mean I was about to say uh colonizers and Christianity yes yes and I I mean mean, and that's the thing is that's what it comes down to is we call it the Christmas tree but before there was Christmas and Christ there were celebrations of these evergreen trees and putting them in your home. Right. And uh, like you talked about, as far as um, Saturnalia, it mm -hmm. is commonly believed that ancient Romans used to decorate their houses with evergreen trees to celebrate Saturnalia. Although there are no actual historical records of it, Mm -hmm. but in the poem, 
uh, Epithelium by uh, Catalus, he tells us of the gods decorating the home of Peleus with trees, including laurel and cypress, and later Libanius, uh, Tertullian, and Chrysotelum speak of the use of evergreen trees to adorn Christian houses. Mm -hmm. So uh, just the, the adaptation of not only Romans, but people in Peru were doing something similar. Um, yes, Germany and France are, were would have been all part of the Roman Empire at that time, but you had the continent of Europe and Asia doing the same thing that, or South America doing something that's very similar. So, I mean, just the fact that Yes, the people that come from Brita or Britain, Europe, had influence <laughs> from these things all yep. around, and then of course, uh, Europe or Britain wound up conquering most of the known world mm -hmm. at that point in time, and of course had taken what would have been the the best of these ideas we, and, we and like traditions that, and we're everything. Gonna that we're gonna, us. yeah. It, it's <laughs> winners write history. The, the, yes, winners write history, and this is the the I guess epitome of uh, uh, um, avoiding copyright. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, or you uh, when you copy your buddy's paper, uh, you, you, you get a few answers just wrong. enough just stuff enough. to to make it. Yeah. yeah. That way, it's not suspicious. So that so that there's not like multiple papers in the classroom with the name Ted at the top, <laughs> right? Now I wouldn't have thought that you would have actually cheated if it wouldn't have been for the fact that you wrote his name his at name. the top of your paper. <laughs> oh goodness! Um, the Viking and Saxon, Saxons worship mm. trees as well, and the story of Saint Boniface cutting down Donar's oak illustrates the pagan practices in the 8th century among the Germans and a f later folk version of the story adds the detail that an evergreen tree grew in place of the felled oak telling them about how it, its triangular shape remains humanity of the trinity and how it points towards heaven just a continuation of our, well we like the thought, we like the idea so we are going to put our stamp on it and this is what it's going to be Mm -hmm. and if it's not then we'll kill you right <laughs> uh, uh, historical practices by region going back to Estonia, Latvia and Germany uh, customs of erecting decorated trees in winter time can, can be traced to Christmas celebrations in renaissance era guilds in northern Germany and Livonia uh, of course now known as Latvia the first evidence of decorated trees associated with Christmas day are trees in guild halls Decorated with sweets to be enjoyed by the apprentices and children in Livonia, present-day Estonia, and Latvia. In 1441, 1442, 1510, and 1514, the Brotherhood of Blackheads erected a tree for the holidays in their guild houses in Raval, now Tallinn, and Riga. On the last day of the celebrations leading up to the holidays, the tree was taken to the town hall square where the members of the Brotherhood danced around it. And if you're wondering, the Brotherhood of Blackheads is an association not to be confused with a bunch of blackheads on your nose. <laughs> the Brotherhood of Blackheads is an association of local unmarried male merchants, ship owners, and foreigners that were active in Livonia in the mid-14th century till 1940, but still remains active in present-day Hamburg. The Brotherhood of Blackheads originated as a military organization. <laughs> The, the precursor to lodges like Elks Lodge and Moose Lodge. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. That's basically like lodge members. <laughs> now, a Bremen Guild Chronicle of 1570 reports that a small tree decorated with apples, nuts, dates, pretzels, and paper flowers was erected in the guild house for the benefit of the guild members' children who collected the dainties on Christmas Day. In 1584, the pastor and chronicler Balthasar Russo, in his Chronica de Provence Lifelent, 
in 1584, wrote of an established tradition of setting up a decorated spruce at the market square, where the young men went with a flock of maidens and women, first sang and danced there, and then set the tree aflame. <laughs> so that basically was almost like a, a Viking funeral. Mm -hmm. A pyre. And after the Protestant Reformation, such trees are seen in the houses of upper-class Protestant families as a counterpart to the Catholic Christmas cribs. And this transition from the guild hall to the bourgeois family homes in the Protestant parts of Germany ultimately gave rise to the modern tradition as it developed into the 18th and 19th centuries. And in the present day, the churches and homes of Protestants and Catholics feature both Christmas cribs and Christmas trees. Every time you say Christmas cribs, I picture like a Christmas character saying, What's up? This is Buddy the Elf. Welcome to my crib. Let's go in. So, the Christmas crib. In Christian tradition, a nativity scene is the special exhibition, particularly during the Christmas season, of art objects representing the birth of Jesus. Oh, while the major. term nativity scene may be used of any representation of the very common subject of the nativity. Okay. But yeah, it's... So what used to be called, like, figures and a decoration was a Christmas crib. But if it was like a play, yes. you called it the nativity. The nativity, yeah. Hmm. Which they do ev every year here. Uh, Stampede does the big live mm -hmm. nativity. And yeah. they also do it at Civic Coliseum and all over the place. Um, whenever the Opry was a thing, we had yep. a, a, a version of it in the Opry uh, mm -hmm. where we actually had angels flying. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, the Stampede does the same thing. The camels. the Yeah, all the livestock, yeah. things like that. So, yeah. Radar. Yes. The Lord, that donkey, I swear. <laughs> um, if you did not, and it was mostly a one particular person that he just had a penchant for just reaching down and grabbing their pants leg and just starting to tug on it. Um, and he got, he gained quite a bit of weight. Um, and believe it or not, do you want to know what the favorite treat of all the animals was? What? Animal crackers. Oh, God. Absolutely went bonkers over being able to get some animal crackers, and that was their treat. That's how you nice. got them to do the things that you wanted them to do. I nice. spent several nights uh, hanging over and doing just the animal portions of the show whenever mm -hmm. they needed a hand, and I would go back with Bob Fluharty and get the camels and radar and everybody else ready, and as you're getting them let in and everything else, you just sit there and you hold out a handful of little animal crackers and they love you to death, man. Meanwhile, at the Halls of Justice, <laughs> or in this instance, Poland, mm. there's a folk tradition dating back to an old Slavic pre-Christian custom of suspending a branch of fir, spruce, or pine from the ceiling rafters called, I'm going to try this one, Podlaznikska. Mm. If I was Polish, I probably could say it. During the time of the Koliada Winter Festival, the branches were decorated with apples, nuts, acorns, and stars made of straw. I wonder if they were the hap hap happiest bunch of nuts or uh <laughs> shot of the North Pole. In more recent times the decorations also included colored paper cutouts, wafers, cookies, and Christmas baubles. According to old pagan beliefs, the branches' powers were linked to good harvest and prosperity. Mm. So even in Poland, still in that Europe, mm -hmm. Euro European region, mm -hmm. they were doing a version of it where they were doing more of the artificial tree. Yeah. They were just hanging the different pieces. Now, the custom was practiced by... Well, here's the thing. All right. So, the upper, because it was saying upper class Protestant families and the, the, the bourgeois, the upper class had the full-fledged tree it was the peasants who wound up having just the trimmings or the pieces that mm -hmm. they could wind up doing mm -hmm. so even back then you've got parents of the less fortunate children who are still trying to do stuff to provide for their kids that they see the these, rich doing the, the rich doing yeah. so um and of course uh that being practiced until the earliest 20th, 20th century, particularly in the regions of Lesser Poland and Upper Silesia. 
Most often the branches were hung above the Wigilia dinner table on Christmas Eve, and beginning in the mid-19th century, the tradition over time was almost completely replaced by the latter German practice of decorating a standing Christmas tree. So it was a situation where there was a, a little bit more of a bridging. Mm-hmm. Uh, the prices of the trees, I guess, potentially went down. Uh, people started knowing that they could make profit off of it, and they wound up having a lot more supply than demand. If there's profit to be made, and, we will do it. Prices wound up starting to drop. Uh 18th to early 20th centuries. In the early 19th century, the custom became popular among the nobility and spread to royal courts as far as Russia. Introduced by Fanny von Arnstein, not related to Ivan Humpelot, mm-hmm. and popularized by Princess Henrietta of Nassau Welburg, the Christmas tree reached Vienna in 1814 during the Congress of Vienna, and the custom spread across Austria in the following years. Okay, it did not reach Vienna in this instance until 1814. 1814. A hundred years later would be 1914. Mm-hmm. Another hundred years later... 2014. 2014. 208 years ago. Nine. Yeah, 209 years ago. 209 years ago was whenever this first reached it was being adapted by royal families in in a much larger broader yeah. recognized spectrum than what it had been for for even centuries earlier mm-hmm. I, it's it's just crazy to fathom that something that had been stolen in essence that long ago took that long to reach this point uh, uh, of being like this in 1814 to what it is now is is insane. Uh, and the custom, of course, spread across Austria in the following years. In France, the first Christmas tree was introduced in 1840 by the Duchess of New Orleans, or Duchess de Orleans, sorry, <laughs> by the Duchess de Orleans. In Denmark, a Danish newspaper claims that the first attested Christmas tree was lit in 1808 by Countess Wilhelmine of Holstenborg. Holsten, Holsteinborg. It was the aging countless or countess who told the story of the first Danish Christmas tree to the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen in 1865. Mm. Name sounds familiar, eh? Mm-hmm. He had published a fairy tale called The Fir Tree in 1844, recounting the fate of a fir tree being used as a Christmas tree. He also later on would publish a story called The Ice Queen, which is the basis story for the Disney movie Frozen. Frozen. And they even pay homage to him with the characters Hans, Kristoff, Anna, Sven. Hans, Christian, Anna. They, They created those characters as an homage to Hans Christian Andersen. I now have something to wind up taking to Katie that I'm Mm -hmm. sure she probably did not know in that instance. So we've touched on the different histories uh, and how different places have have adapted to to using the tree in their own sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there are also, of course, some... some, um, Alternatives, some things that you wouldn't think about, like for the Bahamas, for instance. Uh, the earliest reference of a Christmas tree being used in the Bahamas dates back to January 1864, oddly enough, still in the 1800s in this con- uh, instance, and is associated and would be because of the British having, yeah. you know, the Bahamas, the Bahamas Nassau. at that yeah. time. Um, uh, and is associated with the Anglican Sunday schools in Nassau, New Providence, and after prayers and a sermon from the Reverend R. Swan, the teachers and the children of St. Agnes, accompanied by those of St. Mary's, marched to the parsonage of Reverend J. H. Fisher, in front of which a large Christmas tree had been planted for their gift gratification, and the delighted little ones formed a circle around it singing, Come, follow me to the Christmas tree. And the gifts decorated the tree as, as ornaments, and the children were given tickets with numbers that matched the gifts. 
This appears to be the typical day of or way of decorating the trees in the 1860s Bahamas. And in the Christmas of 1864, there was a Christmas tree put up in the Ladies' Saloon in the Royal Victoria Hotel for respectable children of the neighborhood. Now, the tree was ornamented with gifts for the children who formed a circle around about it and sung the song Oats and Beans. The gifts were later given to the children, children in the name of Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Better know how. Pa -po 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 you see them everywhere. I mean, mm. this time of year, um, homes, parks, uh, courthouses, community squares, mm -hmm. public squares, townships, your businesses have them put up or even multiples people will even decorate trees in their yard i mean they're mm -hmm. everywhere a big reason americans started doing it is because the queen was big with them and you know if the royal family does it america even though we're like we're no longer england we want our freedom if the royal family does something look at how much america tries to emulate it right. despite the fact of we tried to get away from getting it. away from it but if the royal family does it we're right. like, oh, we need that. We need to do it. I mean, well, if the queen does, well, if still the trying, does it, then st still trying to gain independence, even though we want to mimic and, <laughs> and yeah. Some other customs and traditions as part of this uh, include the setting up and taking down of the tree. Both setting up and taking down a Christmas tree are associated with specific specific dates. Uh, liturgically, mm. this is done through the hanging of the green ceremony which in many areas it has become customary to set up one's Christmas tree on Advent Sunday, which is the first day of the Advent season. Yep. And traditionally, however, Christmas trees were not brought in and decorated until the evening of Christmas Eve. Yeah. Now, the end of the Advent season and the start of the 12 days of Christmas tide, it is customary for Christians in many localities to remove their Christmas decorations on the last of the day of the 12 days of Christmas tide that falls on the 5th of January, uh, or Epiphany Eve, which is the 12th night. Although those in other Christian countries remove them on Candlemas, which is the conclusion of the extended Christmas Epiphany season, Epiphany Tide. So, I was always under the impression that the 12 days of Christmas were the days leading up to Christmas. It is not. It is the starting on what would be Christmas Day and the 12 days afterwards. And I just found that out in 2020. Wow. Yeah. I would, honestly, I was today years old. Yeah. I did not did not know that. I can't no remember. Cap. I think I was listening to a podcast like everybody was in 2020. And they talked about that. They said, we celebrate the 12 days of Christmas like it's the 12 days leading up to when technically Christmas is supposed to kick off the 12 days the of 12 Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas. And it makes more sense and I was now. Like, oh my God. Like, all of that makes so much more sense because, all right, on the first day of Christmas, I got first a partridge in a pear tree. Of Christmas. Which honestly would Not be. Not of December. Right. Of Christmas. Well, I always looked at it as like, why were you start this on like December the 12th? Like, what's yeah. the significance of starting this on December <laughs> the 12th or 13th or whatever the case may be to end on Christmas Day? But in this scenario, I mean, if you're looking at it, if back in the day they didn't actually bring anything in and decorate the tree until Christmas Eve. You know how hectic that sounds? But you're putting, like, if you're getting the partridge in a pear tree, that is the significance of the kickoff of... Yeah. Christmas at that point in time. So then right. maybe they brought in pear trees. Yeah, on and there was a bird in there. R right. So all right, day 1 you're getting the partridge in a pear tree. Day 2 is the uh uh crap, I can't even, like I'm on the spot right now. Turtle doves. To, yeah. Two turtle doves. Two turtle doves. Yeah. You keep one and you give one to a friend. Well, I mean the turtle dove as a symbol of love, unity, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, and it's always two, the mm -hmm. two turtle doves. One to give to a special person or mm -hmm. you and your wife, spouse, significant other, whatever the case may be. This is symbolizing yeah. our, you know, our unity, relationship, our, our relationship. Uh, the tree itself is a representation of our home, all right? Three, uh, three French hens. Mm -hmm. I no clue where the rest of this is going as far it's as all the birds. different signi signification for the most part. It's all birds. However, uh, heck of a feast, man. Too many birds. Heck of a feast. 
but yeah, I mean, it just makes more sense now that you're saying, all right, I'm going to start on the on Christmas. Christmas, giving you a gift yeah. every day for the next 12 days. So I don't know. I don't know. According to the first tradition, those who fail to remember to remove their Christmas decorations on Epiphany Eve must leave them untouched until Candlemas, which is the second opportunity to remove them. Failure to observe this custom is considered inauspicious. Well, well you, there's not really any sort of punishment, as it were, but... The, just be talking about you. The, the, yeah, the rest of the community is going to be like, I don't know about them McDaniels. They, they didn't their take their Christmas down tree down. <laughs> right? There the is, gossip mongers. There is kind of still that aspect, though, in today's society. Well, like, you do. I mean, yeah, if you like have your... until Valentine's Day to take their Christmas decorations down. Right. That's just trash. That's redneck. And Some that's... people keep their Christmas lights on all, all year long. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, and putting up the lights over uh, mm. throughout the day yesterday, I'm glad that I've got the little uh, gutter hook so mm-hmm. I can just go back up mm-hmm. and just pop those right out of there. Instead of having to be able to put them on. down. Yep. And mm-hmm. having to go through and pull all that stuff out. Oof. But, yeah, I mean, I could just imagine, you know, back in the day. Alice took it down a day early. Well, Ted took it down a day late. Who's worse? Right. <laughs> yeah. Who would be worse in that situation? Like, if you took it down a day early, are you like. <laughs> That busybody had to go ahead and get everything done, or you know, the person that was the day late. Apparently, oh, they that were bored. Laziness, you know. Yeah, that lazy. <laughs> That's so society, right? Talk trash about the person who was early, and I'll also talk and, trash about and, the person who was and late. Nothing has changed. No, it. Someone is going to find fault in something. Yeah. In, in in any and all capacity, decorations. Let's talk about the specific yes. decorations. Christmas ornaments are decorations usually made of glass, metal, wood, or ceramics, and of course, nowadays, plastic, Mm. um, that are used to decorate a Christmas tree. The first decorated trees were adorned with apples, white candy canes, and pastries in the shape of stars, hearts, and flowers. Take me back to that. Take me back to a day to where I could actually walk up to a tree and... And maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's part of the symbolization is that the tree is providing sustenance and, and nourishment for does. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the entirety of the season. Um, but yeah, uh, take me back to a point to where I can go and just walk by the tree and grab a snack off of it. Um, but uh, glass baubles were first made in Lausche, Germany, and also garlands of glass beads and tin figures that could be hung on trees as well and the popularity of these decorations fueled the production of glass figures made by highly skilled artisans with clay molds so your early what would be mass production christmas ornaments Mm. tinsel and several types of garland or ribbon are commonly used as christmas tree decorations silvered saran based tinsel was introduced later and delicate mold blown and painted colored glass christmas ornaments were a specialty of the glass factories in Thuringian Forest, especially in Lausche in the late 19th century, and have since become a large industry complete with famous named designers. Now, baubles are another common decoration, consisting of small hollow glass or plastic spheres coated with a thin metallic layer to make them reflective, with a further coating of a thin pigmented polymer in order prov- to provide coloration. Lighting with electric lights, Christmas lights, or in the United Kingdom, fairy lights, is commonly done. And a tree topper, sometimes an angel, but more frequently a star, completes the decoration. Or in my household, Kermit the Frog. <laughs> to be more specific, a baby Kermit the Frog that has a Santa hat on. See, my, our tradition in our family was Santa hats. Went on top, top of, the, of tree. the tree. Yeah. We've got the like little baby Kermit in a buffalo plaid shirt with a uh, Santa hat on. That's got like some colorful like little it's made like a little throne back behind him. <laughs> it's really cool. That's, That's what cute. we decided to go for with the topper this year. Uh if not it was gonna be the, the bumble from uh, uh the claymation Rudolph. Yeah. In the late 1800s, homemade white Christmas trees were made by wrapping strips of cotton batting around leafless branches, creating the appearance of a snow-laden tree. So flocking was originally put on 
even more dead or leafless branches to make it give the appearance of having snow on it. And in the 1940s and 1950s, popularized by Hollywood films in the late 1930s, flocking was very popular on west coast of the United States, of course, since they're not going to get any kind of snow. There were flocking kits that could be used with vacuum cleaners, and in the 18 or 1980s, some trees were sprayed with fluffy white flocking to simulate snow, which, of course, we still have to this day. So we've talked about where they come from, mm-hmm. and it appears to be all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, different religions and different... And I guess that you could just pinpoint it down to the fact that people were trying to be, have been trying to figure out, or at that time have been trying to figure out, how everything else was dying. All the leaves were falling off of it. It was losing its color and everything else. Yet you had these trees that even during the harshest of winters... Yep. We're still able to keep their full luster color, um, provide shade in so a we sense, literally whatever. literally called them evergreens. Evergreens, yeah. Um, that they had some sort of special powers and were, you know, needed to be paid homage mm-hmm. to in some sense or use them for some sort of, Medicines you know. Medicine, health, and. And of course, in the, the alcohol industry, I mean, the juniper, we wanted juniper, to use yeah. that to make gin, mm-hmm. the, the botanicals from that to be able to make gin, so. Um, there's definitely a uh, um, mysticism to them, even though we've figured out the answers to a majority of the questions that would have been posed so many centuries ago. Um, but let's start talking about actual Christmas tree production. With the increased popularity over the centuries, as far as to this tradition that has been adapted or stolen or however you want to look at it mm. over the, the centuries. Um, how many trees would be in production or do you think would need to be in production now to quantify oh, God. what the the modern need or demand for Christmas trees are? And you have to think about it too in a situation to where... I'd say we're in the trillions. Certain sizes of these trees are more than four or five years old. Like, some of these trees are having to be 15, 20 years old or more, which means a prior generation started Started the the growth of that tree. Each year, 33 to 36 million Christmas trees are produced in America, and 50 to 60 million are produced in Europe. In 1998, there are about 15,000 growers in America, and a third of them choose and cut farms. And in that same year, it was estimated that Americans spent $1.5 billion on Christmas trees. And by 2016, that had climbed to $2.04 billion for natural trees and a further $1.86 billion for artificial trees. And in Europe... 75 million trees worth 2.4 billion euros, which equivalates to 3.2 billion, are harvested annually. Just one aspect of Christmas, and it's a multi billion dollar business. Just the tree part of it. Not even the ornaments. Just a multi billion dollar business to get. Yeah, not all the stuff that goes on it, not all the stuff that goes underneath it. The tree itself in America is a billion dollar industry. Multi, that makes you want to start. Multi billion dollar. Oh, absolutely. Start a I farm. Mean, I got enough little space right there in my front yard to where I could probably have at least a good dozen, maybe a dozen and a half trees to grow in my front yard and then just recycle mm-hmm. cut one down use it for myself let everybody else buy one off of it or whatever or do it in rows and stage it so that way I could have one and then sell two off to somebody and then for sixty dollars the next year like they're staggered down mm-hmm. and then they just like get to the point to where this row and then this row is a little bit smaller, and then you just keep going until you're starting over again. So if you take pictures of it, you would see like the tops of the trees doing like this. 
That's crazy though the the number of them that are that are done. So as far as the natural trees, the most common used species are fir trees, which have the benefit of not shedding their needles when they dry out, as well as retaining good foliage, color, and scent. But species in other genera are also used. In northern Europe, most commonly used are Norway spruce, silver fir, Nordman fir, noble fir, Serbian spruce, Scotch pine, stone pine, and Swiss pine. And in North America... And crisp pine. And crisp pine. <laughs> I don't think he's done a Christmas movie yet. Unless you consider a Wish uh, uh, a Christmas movie. <laughs> nah. Um, and in North America, Central America, South America, and Australia, the most commonly used are the Douglas fir, Balsam fir, Fraser fir, Grand fir, Guatemalan fir, Noble fir, Nordman fir, Red fir, White fir, What fir, You fir, Here <laughs> fir, There fir, My fir, Your fir. Uh... Dick fur. If you don't understand that reference, which does have a lot of snow involved while not necessarily Christmas, then we can't be friends. <laughs> uh, pinion pine, Jeffrey pine, Scotch pine, stone pine, Norfolk Island pine, Paranarana pine, pa- Paranya pine, mm. not piranha, mm. but per- Paranya, Paranya pine, Chris pine. <laughs> Pine saw. Uh, several other species are used to a lesser extent, and less traditional conifers are sometimes used, such as giant sequoia, Leland cypress, Monterey cypress, mm. and eastern juniper. And various types of spruce trees are also used for Christmas trees, including the blue spruce and, less commonly, the white spruce. But spruces begin to lose their needles rapidly upon being cut, and spruce needles are often sharp, making mm-hmm. decorating uncomfortable. Now, Virginia pine is still available on some tree farms in the southeastern United States. However, its winter color is faded, and the long-needled eastern white pine is also used there, though it is an unpopular Christmas tree because in most parts of the country, owning also to it is faded winter coloration and limp branches, especially after cutting it, Mm -hmm. making decorating difficult with all but the lightest of ornaments. And Norfolk Island Pine is also sometimes used, particularly in Oceania and Australia, and some species of the genera Cosarina and Alocosarina are also occasionally used as Christmas trees, but by far the most commonly used tree is the Pinus Redetia or Monterey Pine. Uh, an Albany woolly bush is commonly sold in southern Australia Australia and is a potted living Christmas tree. Uh, the hemlock species are generally considered unsuitable as Christmas trees due to their poor needle retention and inability to support the weight of lights and ornaments. Now, some trees, frequently referred to as living Christmas trees, are sold with live roots and soil, often from a plant nursery, to be stored at nurseries and planters or planted later outdoors and enjoyed and often decorated for years or decades. And that is something I'm definitely interested in doing at some point in time in the near future is getting a living Christmas tree, one that's not actually cut, still has a root ball to it, and after the season is over with, taking that out and placing it into the yard Mm -hmm. to actually grow and then be able to have one outside to decorate because whenever you do that, you've got a fully grown Christmas tree that you can then put Mm -hmm. out in the front yard and have one to decorate for outside and one for inside. Um... Others are produced in a container and sometimes as topiary for a porch or patio. However, when done improperly, the combination of root loss caused by digging and the indoor environment of high temperature and low humidity is very detrimental to the tree's health. Additionally, the warmth of an indoor climate will bring the tree out of its natural winter dormancy, leaving it little protection when put back outside into cold outdoor climate. So whenever you do that, you have to make sure and get it acclimated. So you'd have to let it finish up inside and transfer it inside and outside. Because plants, if you have them inside, don't like to go outside. Just like if you have some things outside, they necessarily don't make the transition to the inside. Uh, Often Christmas trees are a large attraction for living animals, including mice and spiders. Thus, the survival rate of these trees is low. However, when done properly, replanting provides higher survival rates. 
European tradition prefers that the open aspect of naturally grown, unsheared trees, while in North America, outside western areas, where trees are often wild harvested on public lands, there's a preference for close sheared trees with denser foliage, but less space to hang decorations. Now, in the past, Christmas trees were often harvested from wild forests, but now almost all are commercially grown on Christmas tree farms. And almost all Christmas trees in the United States are grown on Christmas tree farms where they are cut after about 10 years of growth and new trees are planted. So most of the trees that you have in your home as a live tree have been around for about 10 years at that point. So that is definitely a long-term investment and something that if you are looking to get started on that, you're going to have to make sure and have lots of time dedicated to the maintenance and care because you can have so many things happen over the span of 10 years while that first set of trees is getting to the point where they will be ready to be harvested. And similar to the fact that with the alcohol industry, we're having to project what we're going to sell, Mm -hmm. which will denote how many barrels we fill at a given time whenever we are filling stuff because those barrels have to sit for two years before we can sell what contents are Mm -hmm. in said barrels so we have to make sure and try to yeah yeah, it's definitely an investment according to the united states department of agriculture's agricultural census for 2007 21,537 farms were producing conifers for the cut christmas tree market in america and 5,717.9 square kilometers or 1,412,724 acres were planted in Christmas trees. Over a million acres of land, almost 1.5 million acres of land were planted for Christmas trees. Now the life cycle of a Christmas tree from the seed to a two meter or seven foot tree takes depending on the species and treatment in cultivation between eight and 12 years. First, the seed is extracted from cones harvested from older trees, and these seeds are then usually grown in nurseries and then sold to the Christmas tree farms at an age of about three to four years. The remaining development of the tree greatly depends on the climate, soil quality, as well as the cultivation and how the trees are tended to by the Christmas tree farmer. And then, of course, there are the false trees. looks like a pipe with a bunch of pipe cleaners hanging off of it but the first artificial christmas trees were developed in germany during the 19th century through though early examples exist these trees are made using goose feathers that were dyed green (laughs) as one response by germans to continue deforestation so germans actually were early conservationists they didn't like (laughs) they didn't like jewish people um (laughs) But But love the planet. But love the planet and wanted to make sure that there were plenty of trees. So they developed, uh, presumably, some of the first versions of artificial Artificial. Christmas trees uh, to prevent deforestation. Feather Christmas trees range widely in size from a small 5 centimeter or 2 inch tree to a large 2.5 meter or 98 inch tree sold in department stores during the 1920s. Often the tree branches were tipped with artificial red berries, which acted as candle holders. Now, over the years, other styles of artificial Christmas trees have evolved and become popular. In 1930, the U.S.-based Addis Brush Company created the first artificial Christmas tree made from brush bristles. And another type of artificial tree is the aluminum Christmas tree, first manufactured in Chicago in 1958. That's the one that... uh, the old man is referring to in a Christmas story. Mm-hmm. And later in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, where the majority of the trees are produced, most modern artificial Christmas trees are made from plastic, recycled from used packaging materials such as polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Approximately 10% of artificial Christmas trees are using virgin suspension PVC resin. Despite being plastic, most artificial trees are not recyclable or biodegradable. They are made to last, which hence, I mean, they would not be recyclable or biodegradable because if they were, so they would deteriorate. So they started creating these fake trees in Germany to to conserve the real trees on the planet from Mother Earth. 
So they create something that if it were thrown away in a dumpster or in a, a landfill, it would be bad for the environment. Yes. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Sounds sp- like Germany. Speaking of dumpsters, did you know that the dumpster was invented in the state of Tennessee? I did not know that. Yes. That's something for another episode. That but is. Yes, the, the originally named Dempster Dumpster. Uh, yeah. Yes. I have heard of the was, Dempster Dumpster. Was designed in the state of Tennessee. Wow. So, a uh, uh, little gift for... Future, future episode. For, for the the world uh, to add to the already glowing growing list including Jack Daniels, Dolly Parton and Mountain Dew um, but other trends developed uh, also in the early 2000s optical fiber Christmas trees came into two major varieties one resembles a traditional Christmas tree uh, and of course a Dallas based company offers holographic mylar trees in many hues Tree-shaped objects made from such materials as cardboard, glass, ceramic, or other materials can be found in use as tabletop decorations, and upside-down artificial Christmas trees become popular for a short period of time and were originally originally introduced as a marketing gimmick. They allowed cus- consumers to get closer to ornaments for sale in retail stores and opened up floor space for more products. Not to mention an inverted Christmas tree mounted to the ceiling allows you to pet owners, uh, those with cats, certain types of dogs and stuff like that, to enjoy still having a Christmas tree without the worries of them being toppled or uh, any ornaments being destroyed because of unruly pets. And also artificial trees became increasingly popular during the late 20th century. Users of artificial Christmas trees assert that they are more convenient and because they are reusable much cheaper than their natural alternative. They're also considered much safer as natural trees can be a significant fire hazard and between 2001 and 2007 artificial Christmas tree sales in the U.S. jumped from 7.3 million to 17.4 million and currently it is estimated that around 58% of Christmas trees used in the United States are artificial while the numbers in the United Kingdom are indicated to be at around 66%. So over half of the population is using artificial artificial trees as opposed to real trees. And then that brings up the environmental issue debate, which you had just mentioned. And the debate about the environmental impact of artificial trees is ongoing. And generally, natural tree growers contend that artificial trees are more environmentally harmful than their natural counterparts. However, trade groups such as the American Christmas Tree Association claim that the PVC used in Christmas trees has excellent recyclable properties, even though technically it's not recyclable and is non-biodegradable. Live trees are typically grown as a crop and replanted in rotation after cutting, often providing suitable habitat for wildlife. And alternatively, live trees can also be donated to livestock farmers who find that such trees, uncontaminated by chemical additives, are excellent fodder. And in some cases, management of Christmas tree crops can result in poor habitat since it sometimes involves heavy input of pesticides. And concerns have been raised about people cutting down old and rare conifers <coughs> uh, and using them for Christmas trees. So, what about you? What do you think? I, th- I just, I still think that, yes, um, fake trees, artificial trees, in a short run, can help conserve forests and, and greenery and all that. But in the end game, in the long run, that tree will one day be thrown away. Right. Because the cellophane falls off. It's going to eventually deteriorate. It's going to deteriorate over time, or an animal breaks it, or they break very easily. Yeah. Um, That's still going into the environment, and it is way worse than throwing away and letting the earth eat the real tree. Right. And as someone Still way worse for conservation. Who has more uses for a live tree once it's done. Absolutely that can further continue to either provide something useful for me, I don't have an issue with it. No. I prefer a live tree over. But if you're one of those people who 
who is having a, a difficult decision figuring it out one way or the other, here's just a little bit more information from you that can hopefully help you reach what your thoughts on the matter may be. But real or cut trees are used only for a short time, but can be recycled and used such as mulch, wildlife habitat, as I was saying earlier, to use for um, fish cover, uh, or fish use it as cover from uh, predators and stuff like that. Uh, or to prevent even just erosion. I mean, because whenever you have something planted, it's going to keep something or the, the earth from just washing away at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, real trees are carbon neutral. They emit no more carbon dioxide by being cut down and disposed of than they do than they absorb while actually growing. And the argument can be made is since they're continually being replanted, then it's a... a um, it's a renewable resource in that aspect. And it's also the the filtration for the air that we breathe. I mean, it's putting out oxygen. good oxygen yeah. while taking in all the carbon dioxide. Um, however, emissions can occur from farming activities and transportation. An independent life cycle assessment study conducted by a firm of experts in sustainable development states that a natural tree will generate 3.1 kilograms of greenhouse gases every year based on purchasing uh, five kilometers from your home, whereas artificial tree will produce 48.3 kilograms over its lifetime. However, that's not sustaining all the other potential yeah. wear and tear. Yeah. Some people use living Christmas trees or potted trees for several seasons, providing a longer life cycle for each tree. Living Christmas trees can be purchased or rented from local market growers, and rentals are picked up after the holidays, while purchased trees can be planted by the owner after use or donated to the uh, local tree adoption or urban reforestation services, and smaller and younger trees may be replanted after each season, with the following year running up to the next Christmas, allowing the tree to carry out further growth. Now, on the other hand, most artificial trees are made of recycled PVC rigid sheets using tin stabilizer in the recent years. And in the past, lead was often used as a stabilizer in PVC, but is now banned mm. by Chinese laws. And the use of lead stabilizer in Chinese imported trees has been an issue of concern among politicians and scientists over recent years. A 2004 study found that while in general artificial trees pose little health risks, from lead contamination, there do exist worst-case scenarios where major health risks to young children exist. And, of course, young kids always going to be putting stuff in their mouths, going to go up and try chewing on the Christmas tree. And I'd rather them chew on a real evergreen yep. than pipe cleaner and yep. PVC. And in 2008, a United States Environmental Protection Agency report found that as the PVC and artificial Christmas trees aged, it began to degrade. The report determined that if the 50 million artificial trees in the United States, approximately 20 million, were nine or more years old, to the point where dangerous lead contamination levels are reached. And a professional study on the life cycle assessment of both real and artificial trees revealed that one must use an artificial tree at least 20 years to leave an environmental footprint as small as the natural Christmas tree. So you'd have to get 20 years out of your fake tree to be able to basically offset the footprint that a regular tree does. Craziness. Craziness. So yeah. Just have to leave our leave our listeners to, to their decisions yeah. and thoughts as Make to, a decision on your own. You know, if you are going to go the route of an artificial tree or if you're going to go the route of a live tree or if you're just going to take a picture of a tree and slap it up on your wall um there's so many different ways and honestly i've seen some other alternatives for christmas trees that are a lot more environmentally friendly in a sense that you could get longevity out of uh, and those would involve some uh, wooden shelf Christmas trees. Okay. Uh, some that could be done actually out open that are actually round. You have a wooden base in each tier. You have um, basically a large shelf that you can decorate however you want to as a different layer or level 
branches, as it were, air quotes, of the Christmas tree. Or you can do the same thing in more of a 2D version to where it's just flat up against the wall and each shelf you're able to do the same thing. Oh, wow. Um, but that's going to continue or, or have more longevity than what an artificial tree would. But beyond that, you could also, if for whatever reason that were to start deteriorating, it's made of wood. <laughs> so Burn. then you could wind up Burn. burning it or repurposing uh, grind it down, turn it into pine shavings, whatever the case may be, as opposed to trying to degrade or uh, have a, a, a an artificial tree biodegrade. So, but nonetheless, more than anything else, we really just want you to enjoy this time of year. Absolutely, it is a a fantastic time of year, especially if you don't get jaded by the holiday season or if you're coming out of being jaded by this holiday season uh definitely something that we personally encourage you to enjoy and especially make sure that you are able to enjoy it with those um that you love and those that help you be the best person or the best version of you that you can be so absolutely so that is just a little bit of history and information about the christmas tree the first episode in our legends of the season series for this month Hope you learned something. Uh, I believe we all learned a new trivial fact that we can take to Christmas dinner. A little, did you know that? Oh, and I love being the, the did you know guy. Mm -hmm. um, just because you wind up getting the uh, the the times where people are like, how do you know? Do you know that? How do you know that? My brother always says, if it's random, useless knowledge... Uh, call Tyler. Uh, Tyler is always someone you want on your team for trivia because of the random yes. knowledge he has. Yes. He might not be able to consistently answer sports questions, but if a question pops up about something off color or, or weird or, or obscure, he's usually like, I know that one. And then here's why. And when you are asked, how do you know that? Maybe you can say between two barrels podcast. There brought, you go. Brought to you by Tennessee Legend Distillery. But thank you. We hope you enjoy this season as we continue on in this month, uh, learning new things and teaching new things about where this Christmas stuff comes from. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Check out the Studio 66 website for all updated information. Uh, coming very soon are some new Christmas-style swag for Studio 66. So don't forget to check that out in the coming weeks. And again, a reminder about the TennesseeLegend.com merch store. Uh, get your orders in between before December 11th to somewhat guarantee that you will have it for a Christmas present. There is 40% off all orders of $50 or more. So don't forget that's going on. Be anything else. No, uh, other than just like uh, Opie said, make sure that you are keeping in touch that you are keeping up with everything uh, we're not really going to preview much of what mu uh, any of the other shows are going throughout the rest of this month or next month other than the fact that they are going to be uh, at least for this month seasonal oriented mm -hmm. um, but I'm definitely excited about the next one um, for Between Two Barrels um, just the symbology the mm -hmm. origin and everything else of this other uh holiday tradition um we c barely scratched the surface on some of these uh, yes. moving forward today yes uh, but we're definitely looking forward to getting into some more depth and detail uh as we enjoy our holiday season um we might have some shows that are recorded rather early compared to their actual release date Mm. Um, because we do have some uh, Christmas parties and things like that going on this uh, month. Um, but we are not going to stop bringing you all this wonderful information. Um, as Opie said here, only place you can find it uh, without doing all the legwork yourself. And, of course, we don't do all that much ourselves either. Uh, it's more of just our thoughts and opinions on several of these things. Um, but, yeah. You can only find it here on the Between Two Barrels podcast. 
All right. Take care of yourselves, legends. Take care of each other. And as always, cheers to you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Between Two Barrels. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information about what's happening with any of the Studio 66 shows, make sure to like, follow, subscribe, click the thumbs up, whatever you have to do to make sure you get your fill of this legendary content. To do so, search Studio 66 on Facebook or Instagram, or the Studio 66 playlist on YouTube from Tennessee Legend Distillery. You can also subscribe to our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash tldstudio66, for additional content for all of the Studio 66 shows, as well as gifts from the different Studio 66 podcasts and Tennessee Legend Distillery. And if that wasn't enough, you can also visit our website, tldstudio66.com, where you can find links to all of the shows and podcasts, as well as merchandise for all of the individual podcasts, And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Heck, you can even leave us a voicemail if you like via SpeakPipe or send us an email at tldtube23 at gmail.com. However you go about it, make sure you don't miss out on getting even more legendary info about the studio as well as the distillery from Studio 66, presented by Tennessee Legend Distillery.